So yeah, we will give it just a few minutes and we will begin our artist talk. Allow folks to come into the room. <clears throat> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. My name is Miranda Kyle. I'm the Arts and Culture Program Manager for Atlanta Beltline Inc. and curate the annual Art on the Atlanta Beltline Public Art Exhibition. This evening, I am joined by the performance artist Jessica Elaine Blinkhorn as a kickoff to her performance series this year for Art on the Beltline. Jessica is an Atlanta-based artist and performance artist. Blinkhorn's work advocates for the disabled, aging, LGBTQ plus communities. Blinkhorn, who uses a power chair, focuses her work on acceptance through acknowledgement of difference, body positivity, disability education through experience and exposure, human sexuality, and storytelling. Jessica, because of the deteriorative nature of her disease, began to explore performance art in graduate school to assist with creating and constructing a social narrative to promote change, equity, and inclusion. She has been featured on ABC World News, was the subject of an award-winning documentary short, Grounded by Reality, was named a finalist for the Ford Arts Emerging Artist Award, has received grants from Change Inc., Artist Fellowship Grant New York, Foundation for the Contemporary Arts New York, C4 Atlanta, and most recently was named a Franklin Furness Awardee New York. An artist in residence at the Momentary in Arizona, an artist in residence at the Paseo Project in New Mexico. And I also saw Jessica perform last week during Miami Art Week for Satellite Art Fair. For the Beltline, she's performing Reverence, which is a series of traveling performances that were questioned accessibility across the American landscape, where she becomes the object of reverence and serves as a reminder of one's own limitations, the inevitability of mortality, and the systemic need to act right now to accommodate current and future disabilities. So with all of that, I'm very excited to introduce you all to Jessica Blinkhorn. Thank you for the introduction, Miranda, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to jump right into my PowerPoint. <clears throat> it's nothing fancy, but uh, I want to first start with the definition of reverence. So it's a noun, deep respect for someone or something. Rituals showed honor and reverence for the dead or um, <clears throat> regard or treat with deep respect. So you've already kind of gone through about myself, you know, me as the artist. Um, what you don't know is that I am also an educator. I work for Georgia State University part-time. I work for Calumwell Fine, Fine Arts part-time. And then I also am an ADA tester. And I drive around the city and make sure that our city is accessible for people like myself. Um, because of, you know, my aging, <laughs> I, uh, you know, when I was younger, I used to say, oh, it's okay. You know, if there's not a ramp, I don't have to go or, Oh, you know, if I can't get into the bathroom, it's okay, I can hold it, you know, but as you get older, you realize that these things are not okay, and we should not be okay with making do, because we have it written into a federal law that we need to have access, and very rarely is that followed or respected. Reverence is a way of asking you to respect us as individuals, expect, uh, respect our autonomy, and respect the laws. So just kind of a quick rundown about reverence, we three. Uh, you can read this at your discretion because you know, the PowerPoint is up. You know, um, reverence, we three started during the pandemic. The, actually, the idea of it started before the pandemic. I was applying for a grant called the Grassroots Grant that would allow me to travel from city to city and set up kind of like a tribute site or an honor site, memorial site. 
in areas where there was lack of access. And I wanted this to travel around the United States in um, areas with roots in the civil rights movement, but I also wanted it to end at um, Fort Collins and Lincoln, Nebraska, Fort Collins, Colorado and Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, my intention was this would travel across the US and the last two trips would be Lincoln, Nebraska, where I would leave my sister's wheelchair at the site of the murder of Brandon Tina, the um, LGBTQ plus trans youth that was murdered. And then the other one would be left, my brother's wheelchair would be left at Fort Collins, Colorado at the site of Matthew Shepard's um, murder as a way to promote inclusion and show that uh, the disabled community is the epitome of intersectionality. We don't discriminate based upon color. We don't discriminate based upon um, economic background, um, gender, sexuality, uh, religion. Anyone at any time can join. Um, I was denied that grant, but I kept pushing and pushing and pushing because it was so clear in my mind. And then when the pandemic hit, I was kind of faced with this situation where all of my services had changed. Caregivers quit or they were fired because they wouldn't follow the mandates that I required with my care based on you know, COVID-19. And I became trapped in my 600 square foot apartment with my best friend. And during that time, I was also on a drug trial or drug treatment for SMA, which is the disease that I have. And it's the disease that my sister and brother had. Um, I was unable to actually access my treatment because of the, uh, you know, scheduling was like a lot more difficult. It's more uh, time consuming and, you know, they would have to cancel the, just everything. The pandemic threw my community into upheaval. But during that time, I really, really was like, this is where I need to recoup and I need to re-examine what it is I'm saying and how I can make change. Because we're only here for a certain amount of time. You know, our life is tenuous and we don't know when we will exit. And um, I want to leave an impact and I want my community to see change and I want to be a voice for change in my community. So during the pandemic, um, I started just really developing reverence and I submitted it to um, the Paseo Project uh, out in Taos, New Mexico, and they named me their artist for residence. And then I also submitted it to the Beltline. And I was fortunate enough to be here today with you guys. <laughs> so it's starting to slowly make its way. I also submitted it to Miami Art Basel. Um, so it, like I said, it's slowly making its way, but I, I feel like it's a definite performance series that can change the social stigmas that are unfairly placed on my community and will give us a voice in a time when everyone's being heard and everyone's allowed to speak, but we're constantly being overlooked. So some things that you should know about Reverence We Three. Every performance is public. Every performance is different. Um, the music that we'll be playing is a timeline um, because I will have a soundtrack that accompanies me for the Beltline performances. Um, I will likely not acknowledge you. <laughs> However, if I do acknowledge you, please know it's because I see in you something special and unique. And I think that's what we all need to do as human beings is speak up for those who can't speak, love those who need love, help those who need help, and ignite passion in those who feel like the world has overlooked them. Um, and so I want that to happen during my performance. <clears throat> it's important to remember where you started. It helps you to discover where you need to be. Um, I'm about to bring you through a series of performances um, I initially did not want to be a performance artist. And I, I, I still call myself actually an interdisciplinary artist because I do have formal training at George, from Georgia State and Kennesaw State. I hold both my uh, bachelor's and my master's in drawing and painting and printmaking. Um, <clears throat> I actually am a pretty decent fine artist, but because of the disability, drawing becomes a lot more difficult for me. As a way to 
continue to create. Uh, my one of my mentors, actually two of my mentors, in uh, in, in grad school, Craig Dongoski and uh, Pamela Pam Longbardi at Georgia State. I'm sure you guys know them. Um, they really encouraged me to discover uh, or to 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 uh, research performance art, and they opened my eyes to the people that I draw great motivation for. And I say motivation, I say motivation and not inspiration. That's very important because for me. There's nothing inspiring about getting up in the morning and living my life. But what I do should motivate you because I do get up and go out, you know? Um, <clears throat> and I found artists that really motivated me to change the narrative, find strength within myself that it was okay to be in a body that wasn't necessarily found desirable. Um, it motivated me to not really care about what people thought in general. Um, it motivated me to open my mouth and scream, even if there was no one around to hear. I knew eventually someone would hear. <clears throat> so I'm going to go into my past. So that way you have you know, information about what to expect for the future. So this is my very first performance piece. Uh, it took place in a little eatery. Um, that used to, it used to be artistry, but now it's Hudson Grill in Midtown. Um, this is my very first live performance called Marked. It's based on Matthew, Bar Matthew Barney's drawing restraints. I don't know if anyone knows that, but basically it's just him tied to a bunch of cords and he's whipping himself around the studio, splashing paint on the walls and kind of every mark is supposed to be difficult um, and unexpected and unplanned. Um, with this one, I had a canvas taped down to the floor. I was lowered onto that canvas and with a series of extenders, I started making paint marks around my body with black paint. When my legs went numb, um, my friend who's pictured with me, Alex, uh, put me back in my lift, elevated me and rotated me onto another place on the canvas. This went on for about 45 minutes maybe an hour. Um, also, it should not go without saying Alex has been my best friend, my caregiver, um, basically my rock. And he was with every performance with me up until 2016. Um, <clears throat> I met him when I started Georgia State. He changed my life and he gave me a lot of strength. And for that, I'm always going to be appreciative and always praise him. Um, this is also a very important piece because it wasn't my only first public performance, but it was actually held <clears throat> one month to the day of my brother's passing. My brother died in our family home uh, July 5th, 2008. And the little piece of uh, the mushroom Mario shirt that's attached to my shirt was the shirt that my brother wore when he passed. So this was a, a way for me to remember him and to acknowledge his passing and to, to, to continue to push on um, because everything I do is with all the love and strength that I've been given by my family and for my family. <clears throat> I'm gonna get a little bit emotional at times, guys. I'm sorry. I'm just a very sensitive person sometimes. Um, this was my graduate thesis show. My graduate thesis show is called Story from a Chair, Stories from a Chair. A life exquisite. Um, I had about 12 drawings, 13 drawings, um, 10 of which were mounted on the wall and they were actually on little doll staircases that were hung at my eye level so people had to lean down to look at them, which is a little bit of commentary on like how people will condescend to individuals with disabilities and look down at them and, and talk to them like their kids. They had to instead look at my work and praise it at my eye level. Um, and the three doll, the doll staircases were made of three stairs, which is a, a huge number in my performance. Every performance I have has a three in it, in some way, multiples too. Um, <clears throat> mainly because when I was three years old, that was the first time I noticed I was losing the ability to walk. I actually fell down three stairs in my family home. There are three children in my family with SMA. Uh, which was my sister, my brother, and myself. And then SMA is three letters for the initials. So three is a big number. But for this performance, I actually did a live transfer and I read from a, 
a book that I've written, <laughs> I've been writing for years. And it was just, they were stories about being disabled. And then behind me, I had 83 slides projected on the back wall of the gallery that showed um, my day from morning to night, what I took to be me. Basically, I give people the um, opportunity to self-educate based upon experience and interactions. This was a performance called I Think We're Alone Now in the Figurator Gallery uh, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, it was, a, it was a performance based upon sexuality and the infantilization of individuals with disabilities. Um, more often than not, we are met with a lack of sexual autonomy. Um, this was basically a performance where I had a sound piece that was made of solicited stories of first time experiences by individuals with disabilities. Um, flowers were de-petaled and put across my body. And then I had three different types of flowers that were in floral tubes that were inserted to represent the um, character that you need to have within yourself to engage with someone like myself or people from my community. Um, compassion, passion, um, strength, like a lot of other things, but each flower was very symbolic of what it took to be me and what it took to engage with me. And I had three different performance artists from Chicago, each one inserted, and each one came from a different LGBT background. LGBTQ background, sorry. <clears throat> um, this is uh, Art Nod Places, by the way, guys, just in case you haven't read online. Um, I am the 2021 curator for Art Nod Places 2002 story. And I will, <laughs> yeah, clap because it's going to be a, it's going to be a long year. I'm really, really pulling out the guns on like getting things done this year. This was my first performance ever in New York. Um, I did a two part performance called Grays and Gays. Grays was based on um, one of the most difficult things for me to do when I go out in public is speak myself, mainly because I'm a large girl. So people want to know how much I'm going to eat. Uh, two, um, because I'm disabled, my arms shake and get tired halfway through eating. So I begin to drop food. Um, I'm very insecure. So in this situation in Gray's, I set up a dinner party in the street with a two course meal, wine, coffee, water. And what you don't see in the background is a huge pile of trash, which I thought was a great juxtapositioning. Um, I had candles and all this stuff, but I'm wearing this beautiful um, open chest, like razor front garment and neck brace that was created by Nika King, one of our very own Atlanta artists, former student of mine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the, the dress actually has all these words that I have been called throughout my entire life. People have in fact moved at me. Um, People have called me short bus. People have called me the R word. Um, you know, so I wanted to use those words as a point of empowerment. I wanted to say, you can't say these things about me. You can't say anything I already don't know. So this was basically like the middle finger <laughs> to the way people look at me. Um, and then I also have the cow makeup on. I'd like to say this is my best Lee Bowery meets bovine orthopedic like nouveau trash chic. Um, so <laughs> this is my favorite picture, mainly because the coloring, the black and white, and then the pops of pink in the background. But there's another one that's really funny. And it's a guy that's in a wheelchair looking at me like, the hell is she doing? So I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, this was the second part of that performance. This is called Gaze. It was based upon the uh, makeup tutorials that we all see online where we're trying to learn how to make our face look our best. Um, and uh, this is me preparing my face to face the world. Um, I did a live makeup tutorial on how to do your eyebrows because I believe eyebrows are the nipples of the face. <laughs> and um, so I'm sitting there and I have, I'm putting my eyebrows on and it was actually kind of funny because I'm putting my eyebrows on in front of the perfect brow threading salon. Um, and the people inside are actually watching me do my brows. And when the performance was done, 
I posed in front of the, the three stairs, kid you not, as serendipitous as it was, the three stairs. And these women came out and said, you could come inside and we'll do your eyebrows. I'm like, well, no, actually I can't. You don't have a ramp. So it was kind of like it was there in front of them. You know, I prepare my face, even though <clears throat> I know no one sees me unless it's a value to them. And they prove that. In that moment, they prove that. This is from um, Bubbly Creek Performance Festival at the uh, Chauvy Art Center in Chicago, Illinois. This is a su suburb of Chicago called Bridgeport. Um, I love to dance. I watch So You Think You Can Dance. I watch people dance in public. Um, I love to watch the body move. I love to see it contort, twist. I love the way the light hits the form and gives you these undulations of light and dark. It's poetry. Um, and it's a poetry that I don't necessarily understand. So I'm envious, but I still try to do what I can. And one thing I love to do is I love to dance. I mean, I've gone to Mary's and there've been people like uh, Mary's and I'm just in there jiggling what I got. I don't care. I'm just gonna do it, <laughs> you know? Um, even if you look ridiculous, it doesn't matter. If you're having fun, that's really what matters. Um, and so in the spirit of having fun, there was this uh, young individual waiting for a bus and you know we had been out there for two hours already dancing in the rain with a boom box you know holla say anything john kuzak style and we're just having like a street party and this young individual was sitting there and i grabbed their hand i was like would you dance with me and this is us twirling in the streets of bridgeport um and I, it was just such a sweet image that was captured by chelsea uh mark markerson um a really fantastic photographer from uh, Michigan. And it's Marcuson. Marcuson. Um, <clears throat> this is from the Paseo 2019 um, Paseo Performance Festival. Um, I can say this is actually a performance that changed my entire life. Um, I did a performance called Lay With Me, where I set up a hospital bed under a street light in the middle of the street. I had a table beside the hospital bed that was filled with all of my nighttime ritual objects. Um, I brushed my teeth, washed my face in the middle of the street, and then I did a live transfer from my wheelchair to my bed. And I allowed people to come and interact with me however they saw fit while I was in bed. While I was lying there, however, there was a sound piece that played lightly in the background and it was made up of a series of questions or answers to a series of questions that I had sent out to the people of Taos. And those questions were things like, what do you fear when you lay down at night? What do you dream about? What do you hope for? And it was just kind of to show that even though we come from different backgrounds and we look different, <clears throat> we all innately want the same thing. And that's just to be happy and to feel loved and, and to feel safe. Um, so these kids, the most rewarding experience was the kids coming up and wanting to interact with me and parents going, thank you for doing that. Um, I had a young man that came with his dog and he was taking his dog on a road trip because he was worried that his dog that was his best friend wasn't going to be around much longer. And the dog got up on bed and laid with me <laughs> with his little head over my legs. And that man found me a year later and the dog is still alive and happy. A little slower, a lot slower, but he's still hoofing it in Ash Asheville. Um, but, you know, the Palacio Project's wonderful. Uh, Matt, Thomas, all of them up there are wonderful. This is Franklin Furnace. I'm not going to show you the video because we are, I talk a lot. We are already short on time. I want Q&A, so you can go to YouTube and look it up. Um, <clears throat> but I did a performance uh, for Franklin Furnace. Um, as part of Franklin Furnace, you have to create a performance in New York. My original performance was based on interactions, intimate interactions with people with disabilities in public and in private. So there was an outdoor element and an indoor element, but COVID-19 hit, so that had to all be changed. So the, the performance was changed from make me wet to who am I, who are you, a conversation in times of distance where I use the idea of like connecting with people through social media platforms, uh, dating apps, trying to really figure out who it, someone is from the inside out. Um, 
So I had a former student of mine named um, Max Williams. He and his friend Eddie created this three-dimensional cube and outside of it was canvas and there are words taken from every one of my performance pieces uh, written on each wall. And I spent five hours and 33 minutes inside of this cube, um, sweating to death, it's hot. Um, and I could never reveal who I was. They had to stay and they had to wait. They had to use the, um, <clears throat> they had to use the information provided on the cube and figure out who I was. They had my end number. They could act, they could uh, ask me questions from outside the cube. But the point was they had to stay and take the time to get to know me. Without the visual information yielding any knowledge of who I am as a person. And I think that's how we should approach everybody in everyday life. We should see people from the inside out and not from the outside in. Probably save us a lot of money in divorce court, to be honest with you. Um, so this is where reverence, this is where reverence performs. These are my three favorite images. They are done by a wonderful photographer and videographer uh, in Atlanta by the name of Nikki Canodal. Um, they travel with me. They were there at Art Basel as well. Uh, they've been a really big source of, of assistance and documentation. And um, this was the final performance. I did four performances while I was in New Mexico for my residency where I premiered Reverence We Three. And um, for the final performance, I actually had people walk up the staircase where my sister and brother's wheelchairs were placed and I could not access to further reinforce the idea of obstacles that stand in the way of completion. Um, you know, I know one day I will join my sister and brother on that stage. One day I will leave this world, but I'm still here and I'm here so that this ramp, this, this stairwell becomes a ramp. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm talking fast. I'm getting winded too. And I think that's it. This is a video. I'm going to try to access the video. It's not very long. If you can give me one minute, I will try to access this as quickly as possible. Um, so I am going to have to ask you how to share sound, Miranda, because I don't remember, to be honest with you. Um, I want to. You'll have to stop share first. So okay. stop sharing your screen first. And then yeah. when you go to reshare it, there's like a little button on the bottom. So I'm gonna do that really quick. The video is about three minutes, maybe. Um, so that should be, oh, let me go back here. This is really hard to do with really long fingernails, just FYI. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's because I'm new here. All right. It's actually three minutes and 27 seconds, but we'll be fine. Um, okay. Um, sorry for the dead air, guys. You're good. So yeah, when you click the screen share button, there's like a little button on the bottom that you can click that's for share sound. It's right there. Okay. This, uh, this is a reel of my work. Um, this was also done by Nikki Knudel. Um, I think they did a fantastic job. I have become this amalgam of Lee Bowery, Divine, and Ray and Graf, a character from the TV show, My So-Called Life. My logic was if people are going to stare at me anyway, I might as well give them something inspired and fabulous. I went from being the fat, disabled girl who could draw to the freak in the wheelchair who was an artist. It felt like these huge weights of self-imposed punishment and the need to control some aspect of my life had been lifted off of me. It was while in the shadow of this blinding realization that I made the decision to stop hating myself and my life. I made the choice to stop listening to people's unfounded judgments and go back to what I knew and loved. Art. He was my best friend, at times my only friend, and my partner in crime. His death changed my heart. 
I had broken the seal of performance and I was now using this form of art to create a larger social narrative that would pay tribute to my friends with disabilities who had passed, my brother, JB, who had passed, my sister, Erica, who would join them shortly thereafter during the summer of 2012. I still struggle with guilt of my own existence without them, but I know I'm here for a reason, and that reason is to change the world through my creative voice and my advocacy and my activism, so that people like my sister don't have to be afraid to live and love and exist. My work has become a full-blown expression of what it means to exist in a society that wants you to stay hidden behind closed doors, remain unemployed, struggling to survive, exist without love and partnership, and never have the complete independence and autonomy that is afforded and accessible to the normal people of our society. My whole life has been a struggle, but I acknowledge my privilege because I know that I have people in my corner who will, if need be, care for me and advocate on my behalf. Others in my same situation are not as fortunate, and it's for them that I make a ruckus. I know what it feels like to go unheard, to be judged without any recognition of who you truly are as a human, to feel alone and scared that your basic human needs may go unmet because at the end of the day, society doesn't see your value. I don't want my community to continue to go unheard or feel as though nobody is listening. I was raised to help those who need help, to care for those who need care, to love those who need love, to let your strengths be your passion and compassion to never let anyone push you down and never allow anyone to rob you of your ability to get back up. I want my legacy to be lifting up my community, remembering those who have fought until their last breath to be heard and impacting people in a way that allows them to open themselves up to all of life's possibilities, their own abilities and the abilities of others. When people engage with me during the performance, they're changed. I truly believe I changed their perceptions about disability. I just want something accessible, not exceptional. Okay. I would, uh, before we go into the Q&A, I... Uh, Oh, are we good? Okay. Before we go in, I didn't know you were taking over the screen or had a heads up. <laughs> I thought I did something. Uh, before we go into the Q&A, I would like to acknowledge the wonderful people of this city um, who shared my GoFundMe. My performances are not possible without fundraising or without grants. Um, and I, you know, I do work, but my work pays for me to live. Um, anything Additional comes from the good graces of grants and the people of our city. Um, so I would like to acknowledge them. Um, thank you all for making my journey, <clears throat> my journey possible. Um, I would also like to thank my friends who have been there for me, my family and um, the people who care for me to make sure that every day I get up, you know, without all of this, you know, it would be difficult. I'd find a way because that's just how I am. I'm really dominant. <laughs> but thank you all. Well, Jessica, we are really thrilled to be a small part of your journey and your story. And uh, I'm really excited that we can be in conversation with you today and talk a little bit about uh, what people can expect to see on the Beltline coming up uh, in the next few weeks and how that they can engage and participate with the work that you'll be bringing to the Beltline. Um, so before we open it up to full for any other questions, because I have my own like burning questions I would love to talk to you about, um, could you tell us a little bit about the performances as you conceive them that are happening on the Beltline? and how you envision people engaging with your work there? Well, honestly, um, I, I'm i doing an installation of Reverence called Reverence the Warrior. It has a subtitle uh, where I will be this warrior, this revenant warrior spirit 
with complete with headdress and mask by our by our very own Eileen Loy of Atlanta. And the uh, brilliant Sky Kuba Kube of Chicago has been my costume. And I will be on the belt line for three hours. I will begin um, <clears throat> at one, one end and I will continue to go up and down the belt line until I hit a three hour mark. When I begin, I will lay down a series of flowers that represent my, my siblings and the people who have passed. And I will begin a soundtrack that will be a timeline of my life from when I began to realize I was living, I was going to be disabled and the songs that kind of helped me get through my awkward teenage years and the ones that I find empowering now uh, that tell a story. Um, I will continue through the belt line for, like I said, three hours. Uh, when I make the end, I will drop flowers off. And then wherever I stop um, at the end of the three hours, I will leave flowers as well. Um, I will not engage with people. I will be a revenant warrior spirit meant to be symbolic of the people that I am a part of, the disabled aging community. Um, <clears throat> with the, uh, while moving, however, I can choose to break that fourth wall and engage with people that I deem in need of connection, um, where I feel a connection but the, it will be my choice. Uh, it's called, um, it's called um, gathering, I like to call it gathering the gaze. Uh, basically, a lot of people want to like look at me all the time. People stare at me all the time. It's not every day you find a 205 pound rolling thunderous woman covered in tattoos telling you like it is. <laughs> so people, I get a lot of attention. Um, uh, this time, you know, I, I'm actually seeking that attention, but I'm, I am allowing it to happen on my terms. I'm gathering the attention on my terms, and I'm choosing to acknowledge you on my terms. So that's about it. <laughs> so for the East Side Trail, you're going to be starting at like Irwin Street and going north, or where are you starting for the East Side Trail? The Memorial. I'll make my way down that segment of the belt line, uh, cross into Crog Street, um, and then hit the East Side Trail heading to Piedmont Park. That's the longer section that I'm covering. And the West Side Trail, I'm, you know, honestly, I cannot remember the streets because I'm not so familiar with it. So if you could help me with that, Miranda. Or I think it? Yeah, I think we're starting at Elaine Avenue on the West Side Trail. And, and you don't and yeah. Going through the bridge and then returning. Yes. And we'll be doing that for about three hours, uh, every performance. There will be two in the springtime, which I'm not like two performances and two performances. I'm like, ah, I don't like even numbers, but I kept the times at three to six. So those are, it's a three hour interval and I have, you know, you know, three different colors that will be displayed and uh, yeah. It'll be, it'll be an interesting performance. I'm kind of a, like, going to have to invest in hand warmers and foot warmers. But and, people can, and people can find your performance schedule and maps and everything we'll have posted up on our, our social media platforms as well. Um, yes. So um, I know that we have a, a couple of people who probably have been, you know, hanging out, listening to the, the artist talk, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if that's okay, like before we got to anybody else, um, I'm selfishly like centering all my questions. Um, so you talk a lot in your artist talk and in your work about this um, desire and work towards visibility and equity, particularly in interpersonal relationships. And your work has this push and pull between like intimacy and public persona or intimacy and, and public interaction. So from the interpersonal to the, to the public. Um, and I'm sure you're exhausted by people calling you brave all the time or just asking to be recognized um, as a person with needs, just like anyone else. Um, as you move through this work, do you find the interpersonal 
or the public performances and work that you create more challenging? I think when I started performing, it was more an internal issue for me, being vulnerable, allowing people to know my business in that way, that, that undisclosed intimacy and how it affects you emotionally. Um, I think as I began to age and as I developed my work and I became a little more comfortable in my life, it was really the outside standards and, and availability as far as accessibility that became problematic. Um, that really began to, to inform my work. Like I said, you know, I used to say I could make do and I was a good time gal and I'd go out and I'd go to the bar and have a drink and I would not go to the bathroom and I would come home and I'd be like, oh, I gotta go to the bathroom. But now it's like, I kinda wanna go to the bathroom in the bar, man. Like, come on, make this happen. There's no reason why it shouldn't happen. Um, but I think as far as like, I don't know if they answered your question, Miranda. Um, I, I feel like I, I, need to I need to create connections. And I, I'm the type of person that I feel like if you go after somebody with your agenda in a way that is combative and aggressive, you're basically bricking people into a box that they won't listen to you from inside of. They'll just turn them off away. So I like to create connections with people. I like for people to feel comfortable with me because if they feel comfortable with you, they're going to trust you. And if they trust you, they're going to listen. If they're going to listen, you might, you might change their perspective. You might change their mind. And it's the same way I approach my students in class as well. I give all of my students the ability to ask me two questions at the beginning of the class because I want them to know me. I want them to trust from me, trust me, because they're going to have to learn from me. We're all teachers and we're all students in this world. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. You know, I guess we all, I think one of the really powerful parts of your work is that, especially as like femme or female socialized people we come to your work with a lot of our own baggage about our own bodies and the way that we exist in the universe anyway. And seeing your vulnerability um, can be challenging for us too. For, I know it's challenging for me. And so I am always curious about what component of your practice is the most difficult, you know, that deeply intimate component or that more public facing, dealing with the correct, you know, the, the public perception of, of you as a human working in that space? I mean, it's kind of difficult to say because it can, that can really come from so many different directions. Um, because I think when people get to know me, they actually begin, the, the, this, the disability begins to dissolve away. You know, um, when it comes to like, being vulnerable in my performances and like women that come to my performances or people that are, you know, feminine coming to my performances and uh, me embracing my physical difference in such a way that it might make them feel more comfortable with themselves. Like I, I really hope that when people come, they can feel comfortable with themselves because we all need to feel comfortable with ourselves. But it's also important to remember that when I perform, that's just another part of myself. There's a, different side to everybody. Just like with disability, people that post all this inspiration form, but they don't post challenges. There's duality, there's complexity in storytelling, you know? And um, for me, I feel like when we talk about my body engaging and the intimacy and the emotional response to the crowd, I'm happy if they feel some sort of motivation and courage that, that's pulled from me being able to be in this body in such a public setting. But like I said, it's also a character that I'm playing because in my house, like I'll have a group full of people and I'll be like, all right, everyone close your eyes because I'm getting out of my chair in the middle of my living room and I don't want anyone to see my behind, you know? You can still have that vulnerability in your personal life, but you can feign that. You know, I feel like everyone does actually. Everyone feigns confidence some way. You have to, you have to. Um, as far as like, with other works, you know, I feel like the most difficult aspect of the work 
placement and it, it being existing in public, it comes, it doesn't even come down to what you would think. It, it definitely is about access. Like I want there to be a, an acknowledgement of the lack of access, but in order for me to have the ability to have performances accessing funds because there are so few funds for disabled artists, so few, so few. Um, so I guess like there's this financial strain with me. There is this like emotional strain because some people actually want to use me as a conduit to figure themselves out, you know, and, and not that I mind that. Um, I appreciate that. There's just, oh, there's so many ways. That's like a really good question. I can't really, I can't really. <laughs> Voice that. That's a, that's a very like multi tiered, complex answer. I hope that right, is. and it's it's cultural too, right? Because I think even as like Southern women, right, we're socialized to engage with people differently than how you know some of our peers who maybe were socialized in much more liberal cultural settings were than we are. You know, that's very true. But I come from a very conservative. Christian, uh, you know, a uh, school teacher mother who actually I feel like is more liberal than she allows herself to be. I feel like she's holding on to it because her dad was a certain way. That's another story. And then I have a very liberal dad. My dad is a biker musician. My dad is the house band at the Claremont Lounge. Like he's like, my dad's super duper like charismatic. Um, so I kind of, that's why I can, I can control the way I act in certain areas and I can't really control the way I act in certain areas. Um, I, I really like to be as open and transparent as I possibly can be with the people that are engaging with me, whether it be during a performance, whether it be in a classroom, whether it be at home, um, even right now, like you could ask me anything and I'm going to tell you what I think. You just have to be ready to hear it. That's amazing. Um, well, let me see if there we have any. Um, I'm going to stop the share and see if we've got anything in the Q&A or any questions in the chat. I currently don't see anything in the chat, but if anybody who's joined us has any questions, they can drop them either in the chat or in the Q&A box. Don't see anything right now. So Jessica, you and I can continue talking. Um, when you are, as an artist, you touched on briefly um, the need for additional funding um, or access to funding, um, which seems pretty endemic to a lot of the creatives um, occur, you know, in this post-COVID universe, but also just in general, particularly performance artists. What is something that you would love to see become more accessible or easier or an easier route to additional funding for performance artists or artists like yourself who are working at all these intersections of identity? Well, that's difficult because I'm not, I'm not really, you know, I apply for grants, but I don't know a whole lot about the funding side of the arts. But I would say in my experience, um, you know, I, I've been very fortunate that there are people that know my work and believe in my work um, who have been, in a way, philanthropists of certain things. Um, I really do wish there were more grants to uh, that cater to the um, disabled, BIPOC, LGBTQ plus aging communities. Um, I don't feel like there are enough of those, especially with the disabled community. It's kind of, um, it's actually <laughs> kind of difficult to like look online for all these grants. And if I want to do this project or I get accepted into this festival, like find funding, applying for these grants and finding and looking specifically for disability and like artist grants. It's so slim, it's so slim. You have the Wind New House, which you have to be nominated for. Um, you have um, <clears throat> the Disability Future Fellows, which you have to be nominated for. Um, and these are top tier grants. These are grants that could fund a year of, of my work, maybe even two years of my work. Um, but there are no like lower level grants that, that cater to individuals with disabilities. 
Um, I find that really frustrating. I have, I was very fortunate. Like this this summer, um, I was unable to work, and um, I was I was like, how am I going to pay my bills? So when I got back from New York, I had a I had a week between New York and um, a week between uh, New York and New Mexico, and I was like, all right, let's get to grant writing. So I went online and I applied for five grants, five grants, and I got four of the five that I applied for and I was able to fund my entire life, <laughs> basically, up until the last month, really up until the last month. Um, you know, so, but that, I can't really, it's just difficult for the arts period. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, Cause I don't feel like people value art the way they used to. Artists used to be rock stars. We were court painters, painters for royalties. We were the ones that made sure that, you know, the, the proof of our existence was around. And now we're trying to just exist. And I, I also feel, and this is something I, I kind of do want to stress, even though we, you know, I wish there were more participants on right now, because it's something that I think that we all need to keep in mind. And that is, if we are going to exist, into other creative realms, watch our arts continue. We actually need to stomp out elitism in the arts community. Not everybody need, not all the same people need every grant all the time. There are people that's work have merit and feeling and honesty and tell a story and they're just not getting the acknowledgement that they deserve. They're not getting the support that they deserve. I feel like we need to start building these bridges instead of burning them down before we've even like stepped foot on them. It's like one person goes up, we're all there helping them build it, but then they set it afire as they're crossing and we have no ability to cross with them. And that's got to stop. It's just got to stop. It sounds to me like you have another hyphen to add to your job description because that that's spoken like a true curator right there a person with a vision well I mean honestly like yeah this this curatorial excursion I'm about to go on is I'm really going to show people what I can do I actually love curation I you know there's something that people don't know about me but every one of my performance trips I bring students with me I hire my students uh, costumes are local artists or artists that have disabilities um, and I do it because I want to be the mentor that I'm asking other artists to be because when my students are no longer my students and they're my colleagues I want them to find people that they believe in and that they see and that they know have value and I want them to help get them up, you know? Um, <laughs> I, I would be nowhere as an artist if it weren't for my father's charisma and my mom's patience. <laughs> That's what I like to say. You know, my mom is a strong, 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 strong woman, strong woman. She's got her doctorate. She took care of three kids by herself with disabilities. When my dad was off touring the, the world playing overseas, and, you know, war torn areas, you know, and then, you know, my dad can, you know, when my brother passed away, my mom and dad, we didn't have money to bury my brother because they won't give us burial insurance because we're terminal. My dad know, knew so many people that people actually paid to have my brother buried. And my brother was led to his resting spot, as was my sister, with a procession of Harley Davidsons all the way there, hundreds. You know, that's my dad's charisma. The reason I'm able to exist is because I know when to say enough is enough. I know when to listen. And I know when to lead with my heart instead of my head. And I also can smell a lie. This is gonna sound so trashy. I can smell a lie like a fart in a car. In all honesty, <laughs> that's why I'm trying to, like me talking like that. I'm actually creating connection because you feel comfortable saying stuff around me. You know what I mean? And like, 
I've coined myself, and I'm going to have t-shirts made. I've coined myself Nuvo Crip Punk Trash. Because I'm the rebirth of disability in a creative, trashy, punk rock way. I and I'm asking all of you. You can be on crutches. You can be on skates. You can be on walkers. You could be any color, any sexuality you want. Just follow me and like, because it's really about community, you know, this separation into different <laughs> subsets of society. I mean, you're you're asking for inclusion and people practice elitism every day in their own social groups. And we can't do that. We can't. Well, Jessica, it has been incredible talking to you and hearing about your project and your process. And I hope Everyone who views this artist talk after the fact makes their way out to the east side and or west side trails to see your performance of reverence. Um, and I just can't thank you enough for your time and being with us today. And uh, you can see more of Jessica's work on her website. You can follow her on Instagram. We will have the links to all those things in the post once this hits social media. You can also find out more about the project and the calendar of events at www.art.beltline.org. And before we sign off, we just have to make sure that everyone had, carries in their hearts all hail the nouveau crip punk rock trash queen. Um, and Jessica, you are incredible. And thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. And I hope that I will see plenty of people out there and um, you can feel free to come and take pictures, bring flowers. I ask anyone that comes to the performances to bring flowers. You can lay them anywhere I've laid them. Um, be mindful of people on roller skates and skateboards and wheelchairs, lay them out of walking paths. Amazing. Thanks y'all. Have a great evening and see you out on the trail. <laughs>